Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Mike Matthews from MustfulLife.com back with another episode of my podcast. And in this episode, I interview James Krieger from Weightology.net. Now, in case you haven't heard of him, James is a published scientist. He's an author and a speaker and someone whose work has really helped me better understand the fundamentals of losing fat, building muscle and staying healthy. I came across his work early on in my travels in this space. And uh, I think the first article of his that I ever read was on uh, how insulin works in the body and how it relates to fat storage and fat burning. And that really crystallized for me why insulin isn't the enemy and carbs are not the enemy and why overeating really is the fundamental mechanism underlying weight gain. So thank you, James, for writing that article. Uh, He's written hundreds of other articles as well over the years, and he has a a knack for breaking down complex ideas and systems into easily digested morsels, which is really what I strive to do in my work as well. So I really appreciated the effort that he put into uh, all the articles that he has posted online. So in this interview, I pick James's brain on the hot issue of eating grains because we're hearing more and more these days that grains, they just make us fatter and sicker and dumber. But, you know, you have to wonder how true are these claims? Um, Is it true that wheat is slowly killing us? Uh, Should we avoid gluten? Are some grains safer or better to eat than others? Uh, What about GMO crops? Should we worry about them? Should we not worry about them? And in this interview, James answers all of those questions and more. So if you've been wondering or worrying about your grain intake, then you should definitely listen to what he has to say, because I think you're going to find it interesting. So with that, let's get to the interview. Hey, James, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I'm excited to talk to you uh, because this is a subject, grains, eating grains that I get asked about frequently. I've written a little bit about it. Um, I've spoken a little bit about it, but I haven't really done a you know, whatever 30, 45 minute discussion on it. And for people listening, if you haven't heard about the grain controversy, then uh, you probably are not paying much attention to the, to the health and fitness space. Cause with books like, you know, wheat belly has sold a bajillion copies and grain brain has sold a bajillion copies. And I think they have follow-up books and, you know, paleo is huge. And a lot of it is about just demonizing grains, of course, and then wheat in general and promising great things uh, if you if you just stop eating you know wheat or grains and so what's uh, I'm gonna pass the mic to you here James so what are your thoughts on the state of grains and you know should we should we be worried about it should we not be worried about it unless you are the very very small percentage of the population who has uh, gluten intolerance or something like that which is a very very small percentage mm-hmm there's no reason to be concerned about grains. And I, I get frustrated with the whole grain thing. And, you know, you got guys like, like Perlmutter, you know, mm-hmm. with his grain ba- brain book and stuff. These guys that are doing this stuff, they're just looking to sell books through fear mongering. I mean, f- let's face it in the nutrition industry and health industry, fear mongering sells. I mean, if, if you want to make a lot of money, then all you got to do is make people afraid of something mm-hmm. and, you know, have it, you know, and if you can just make it remotely sound scientific, yep. then you can make a ton of money and people will buy your books and, and, and buy everything. Your nutrition courses and come to your lectures. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I think there's also something to be said for the marketing of it that it's like you can just isolate this one thing and here's the, here's the boogeyman. And if you just get rid of this, then, you know, a whole new life is going to open up to you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, I think these people are taking advantage of human nature. It's human nature to want to find some single thing to blame. Right. You know, and, and I think from a marketing perspective, these, these people that are selling these books and doing these things are just taking advantage of that. And so, you combine that with the fear mongering and, and yeah, you, you, you become a New York times bestseller like Gary Taubes, you know, making, telling people first you, you should be afraid of carbs. And now he's, he's kind of gone away from that. Now he's on sugar, but yeah, yeah. you know, it's uh, like, don't, don't who cares about calories. That's old thinking, you know, energy yeah. balance is nothing. <laughs> it's, it's nonsense. Um, and so, I mean, it was so funny cause actually, you know, I, I did a lecture in Australia just this past summer 
And I was there with uh, Alan Aragon and, and Brett Contreras and, and Brad Schoenfeld. And on my flight, I didn't even know this. I was on the airplane and I looked back and actually Brett was on my airplane. I didn't even realize that. And so I sat down oh, and we cool. were talking and we were talking about the same thing. We were like, if we really wanted to make a lot of money, we could just we could just totally make up some bogus thing and and just make it remotely sound scientific and just sell tons of money and totally take advantage of people. Of course, we're not like that. We would never do that. But it, it's the nature of the industry. And, and I think the, the whole grain thing is a typical example of that. You can take these certain isolated studies where, you know, there's there's a few papers here and there that, that would show that grains may, you know, stimulate some certain types of inflammatory responses um, in the intestine or something like that. You'll find a few isolated studies like that. And so people will take that and say, Oh, you yeah. got to avoid the grains, you know? Yeah. And you have to look at, you got to look at the whole picture. You got to look, look at what is the weight of the evidence? You know, Alan has talked a lot about this. I talk about this all the time. You can't take some isolated study, especially a study that looks at something like, uh, an immune cell reaction to something. I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't tell you what's going on in the whole body and what's going to happen over time. Right. You, you got to look at, I mean, your gold standard are going to be your randomized controlled trials on humans. And then, you know, that's, and meta analyses and things yeah. like that. That's kind of the, 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 the best evidence. And then below that you'll have like observational data, epidemiological data, things like that. Case studies. When you look at, yeah. So when you look at the randomized controlled trials on grains, when you look at the observational data on grains, it's almost unanimous that there is either a health benefit or at least a neutral effect. There's no evidence that there's some negative effect. And so anyone trying to sell this idea that grains are somehow harmful, it's, it's, it is not based on best evidence uh, and, and it's simply not, it's, not yeah, it's just not based on the best evidence that exists. And, and where, so, so, you know, some of the things that people hear, like, for example, wheat is particularly demonized these days yeah. as, as this is, this is the real, like, yeah, you know, you should eliminate these, the other grains, but if you eat wheat, then it's really a problem. Um, where, you know, for example, I, I, some of the things you just hear is that today's wheat is very different, like than you know, it was a hundred years ago because of genetic modification and stuff like that. Oh, that gets into the whole GMO thing. Again, there, there's no evidence for it. There's no, it's like, ah, I get so frustrated when I hear people say these things. It's like, the, it's it's not based on any solid scientific evidence at all. I mean, it's just people, it's either people that are just fear mongering or they, they'll take some small thing they saw in a study totally out of context mm. and, and just run with that, you know, and it's, you know, I, yeah, there's so many things you have to consider. I mean, let's just hypothetically, let's say you see a study that shows some ingredient or some component of wheat stimulates some inflammatory reaction in a particular type of cell, mm -hmm. for example, let's say, you know, so you get these fear mongering people who take that study and they'll say, look, wheat causes inflammation, blah, 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 blah. No, that was under very specific conditions. Yeah. And you're not, you have to consider what's the dose, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I mean, that's, that's one thing that a lot of people forget about is, is, um, is, you know, what is the dose? Cause sometimes w with a lot of, you know, I can take almost any substance and show some type of problem with it. If I use a high enough dose, I yeah. mean, perfect drink, example is, I drink, mean, uh, go drink five gallons of water and see how you feel. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's a condition called hyponatremia, which can actually kill you if you drink way too much water. Right. Um, so there's a, there's a, you have to consider the dose and the context of whatever you're talking about. And when people start talking about wheat and things like that, they'll, again, they'll take some of these isolated studies. When you look at the amounts that people consume mm -hmm. and what are the overall impacts to health, again, the, the impacts are either neutral or positive. And, and that's the thing you, you, you can't separate out the positive benefits either. I mean, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to use beans as an example, for example. Certain types of beans, there's – there's a, actually, no, I won't use beans. Let me use peanut butter as an example. Mm -hmm. Peanut butter contains something called aflatoxin. It's actually toxic, yeah. right? 
Yeah, the the bulletproof guy is all about this, right? He says his coffee is like uh, I know it's it's a story, but yeah, <laughs> that's where a lot of people that, probably have heard of this. Yeah, yeah. So so aflatoxin is found in peanut. Butter. It's found in all peanut butter, but and it's a toxic substance. It's a toxic substance. But here's the deal: the amounts are so small that they they have no they have no physiological consequence to your body. Mm. Again, it's a dose thing. Mm. Um, another example is methanol. So. Uh, um, and I, I bring this, you know, aspartame, for example. So mm-hmm. aspartame, NutraSweet. Aspartame, when it's broken down in your body, it's broken down into um, its component amino acids, phenylalanine, uh, aspartic acid, um, and then also methanol. Well, methanol is wood alcohol. It's actually a toxic substance. But here's the deal. You will get more methanol drinking orange juice or eating fruit than you would ever get from aspartame. And again, it's because our body can handle certain amounts of methanol, no problem. It's it's if you consume, you know, if you if you consume huge amounts of methanol, that's where it's a problem. So right. you, you have to consider the dose and the context. Um, and you also have to weigh the, the also the positive benefits of something. So, for example, we talk about wheat. Well, most foods with wheat also have have a um, have a high fiber content, for example, mm-hmm. things like that, which can actually have benefits. And so you can't, and if you it's, can't if just it's isolate not highly these. processed, it'll have nutrition, nutritious value as well. I mean, yeah, maybe, it, maybe wonder bread is not the best thing to eat. You could make a better it, choice, but yeah, you can make a better choice, but you know, but even, even wonder bread. Yeah. It might not be the best choice because it's refined, but you know what? I mean, you can still, if you have a few slices a day, it's not going to do anything. Right. Know? Right. I mean, you know, now, you can fit you it into an overall plan. If you looked at the person, the average person on the average, you know, kind of the standard American type of diet, uh, and this is something even with the low carb, you know, craze that I've said many times myself is that okay, if you're an average person, you are overweight, you're sedentary, um, you know, you drink alcohol semi semi regularly, you probably yeah. you probably smoke as well, so you have a lot of things that. Are, uh, are are kind of working against your overall health. And so, you know, I, what I've seen just with people reaching out to me is that you have people in that, they go from that situation to maybe they read Grain Brain or Wheat Belly and, you know, their normal diet is like carbs, 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 and it's just refined crap. And they eat the Wonder Bread and then they eat yeah. pasta and then they maybe have croissants and donuts and shit and whatever. And they, so they go from that to then they go, oh, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to stop eating that stuff. And they go, what am I going to replace those calories with? And and then they happen to make some better choices and, yeah. and, then, and then feel better. Maybe they lose a little bit of weight and, and, but you know, they misattribute what they don't understand what actually just happened there. They thought it was, they cut out the wheat and all of a sudden they lost, you know, over the next yeah. X number of weeks, they lost 10 pounds and they feel better. Well, it's like, yeah, but that's not because the wheat was, was holding you down. It was that yeah. your diet as a whole sucked and you were eating too many calories yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's, I mean, that, that gets in line too with, you know, yeah. People that switch to low carb diets or, mm-hmm. or anything like that. I mean, you know, especially, you know, you had mentioned pastries and those types of foods, you know, some of these foods like cake, things like that. I mean, they're very energy dense. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, of course, if I eliminate foods like cake and cookies and things like that, Oh, what happens to my energy intake? It's going to go down because I'm not, I'm no longer eating these energy dense foods. Um, and also these foods are typically very palatable, you know, yeah. they're highly palatable. They taste good. They actually encourage us to overeat or override our natural appetite signaling mechanisms. So, yeah. So if you reduce those food, th- those types of foods, well, yeah, then of course you're going to start to lose weight and you're going to start to feel better. But it had no, yeah, like you said, it had nothing to do with the wheat or the grain or some specific ingredient. You, you reduce the energy density of your diet. And you possibly reduce the palatability to a point where you, you weren't um, feeling like, you know, that there's always, there's a reason why people always feel like they have room for dessert and it's got nothing to do with, it's got nothing to do with some hormonal effect of sugar or something like that. It has everything to do with palatability and, and dessert tastes great and it stimulates the reward mechanisms in our brain. And so, yeah, so we're going to eat it even if we're not hungry. And so um, you know, the whole palatability thing is a, that's a totally separate issue, but it's a, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a, it's a major, it's a major driver, um, of obesity. I mean, you know, all the, a lot of the foods we eat nowadays, the processed foods, things like that, eating out. I mean, these are, we would almost call it hyper palatable foods. I mean, yeah. they're basically engineered high sugar, high fat, 
yeah delicious <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're engineered to just encourage us to eat more even when we're not hungry you know so and i would say that probably then when we're looking at grains the type of grains at least uh, you know a lot of the, the people that again are more in that standard american diet uh you know subsection the type of grains they're eating are going to be more of these highly refined highly palatable foods it's i don't think these are the average person in that crowd they're not like you know eating ezekiel bread or something for breakfast yeah. like that's not to, that's not what we're talking about we're talking yeah, about yeah, yeah the, the you know they go to get their coffee and they're eating three pastries with it as well uh so i think yeah. that's another just just a, a good point to make that we have to look at the overall picture here and say okay so what types of grains are they eating and how are they living uh, yeah. You know, but if I think if you took those people to your point, you're saying, yeah, okay, if you ate a couple slices of Wonder Bread a day, it doesn't really matter. It, I would say to the person, like, if your diet on the whole makes sense, you're not like starved for nutrients and you, yeah. take, and you take care of your body. I mean, would you agree? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. I mean, you know, I, I'm a person I favor kind of a flexible dieting approach, kind Same. of some of it, you know, if it fits your macros. But at the same time, people, people tend to misrepresent that as saying, oh, are you just saying people can just eat whatever they want, you know, mm -hmm. as long as it fits their macros, you could just live off candy and protein powder all day. And it's like, no, I'm not saying that because, I mean, it would be very hard to stick with something like that simply because you probably feel hungry all the time, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, theoretically, yeah, you could get you could get lean and ripped on, Anything. as long as your protein intake is up, on, you know, it probably doesn't matter, but, yeah. but it's more the adherence factor you know, you're not going to be able to adhere to something like that simply because, you know, some of these two foods are just not as satiating. So especially if you're in an energy deficit, you know, you're still going to want to have most of your diet coming from whole foods, you know, yeah. things like that. Yeah. I mean, I, I wrote an article recently about clean eating and basically kind of saying that even as someone that, you know, I, I also uh, recommend flexible dieting as I think it's, yeah. it's, it, 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 it's, it's the best overall approach i think for for most people i have come across yeah. people that have problems um regulating their you know they, they they really do need to cut out sugar for a bit because oh. they, you know what i mean they just like once they start eating it they feel like they can't stop and so forth yeah and then, yeah and there's people like that you know it's like you know it, you have to have an individual approach but like you said for most people it's going to work fine yeah know? yeah so. but how that the intelligent flexible dieter though looks i think more like a clean eater than you know your average ifym instagram bro that you know posts yeah. nothing about you know every every other meal is like like candy or or ice cream uh, yeah, or, yeah. or some bullshit yeah. because when you when you really look at it if you're going to get the majority of your calories from nutritious foods i mean then your meal plan starts to kind of look it looks pretty clean in a sense because you're eating yeah, a lot yeah. Of, yeah. You know, you're eating a lot of stuff that you know you're gonna have fruits and vegetables and whole grains and so forth yeah. um so on on the on the point of grains, then what type of grains then would you say are the the best ones to 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 choose from, and which ones are of you know I would say lower nutritive value or that you should not necessarily limit your intake on, but like okay, so here are, these are the grains that you're doing yourself a favor. You eat these grains; these are the grains that are neutral. Like you know, if you ate if eighty percent of your carbs were coming from these, probably not a good idea. Yeah, I, I say really, it just comes down. I think whole versus refined grains. I mean, if you really want to simplify it, um, big thing is usually like if if I'm at the grocery store and I'm shopping and I'm looking at grain foods, mm -hmm. the, the thing that I really look for is actually I'm not as concerned of whether it's whole or refined grain. Typically, I'm actually looking at the fiber content. Mm -hmm. So because you can have some whole grain foods that are actually pretty low or almost non-existent with fiber, for mm -hmm. example. If you, I mean, you could have some more refined grain things that still have a decent amount of fiber in it. So, yeah, I mean, if you want to jump in real quick and explain why that is, that's a good point. Something fiber is, uh, you know, a lot of people, as they start to get educated in this space, they learn about calories, they learn about macros, yeah. but fiber is something that's not talked about much. And why does it, you know, why is that important? Why do you pay attention to your fiber intake? So, uh, so the reason I pay attention to fiber intake is number one is um, there's some evidence, although it's, I will say it's not totally um, consistent. You know, it depends on what research you look at, but obviously there's some evidence that fiber helps with satiety. Mm -hmm. So it's going to help you feel fuller. Um, and then there's po possible other health benefits. I mean, we know that um, there's some data, observational data. Now, again, there's limitations to this data that suggests that, you know, higher fiber intakes are associated with a lower risk of colon cancer mm -hmm. um, and lower risk of heart disease and things like that. 
if you're someone who has problems with blood glucose regulation, so either you have type 2 diabetes or let's say you're, you're um, insulin res- – maybe you don't have type 2 diabetes, but you're insulin resistant, which yeah. means you're on your way to type 2 diabetes. Fiber helps slow the release of glucose into the bloodstream. So that's going to help you with your blood glucose control. So, so there's a number of benefits to fiber. And, and typically when I, talk, when I think of whole grains – Usually whole grain foods are usually higher in fiber than refined grains. Now that's not always the case, but it's it's usually the case. And that's so usually I'm more looking at the fiber content of a grain food. Um, so for example, when I buy pasta for myself, you know that I usually I use I look at uh, you know I usually just buy the Barilla brand, and I'm no I'm not paid by Barilla here, but. Uh, <laughs> um, but they have different types of pasta, you know, although they, and they have a whole wheat pasta. If you look at the fiber content, it's actually got a pretty reasonable amount of fiber. It's something like five or six grams per, um, per serving. Mm. So, um, compared to the more compared to the regular white pasta, which I want to say is probably two grams or something yeah, like that. So, two, yeah. so I go for the whole grain pasta or the high fiber pasta, um, you know, based on those, those reasons because of the, the superior fiber content. So, Makes sense. And then what about like rice, for example? I, I this also even written about this, you know, white rice versus brown rice. And then you have variety. Well, that's an interesting one, you know, because, you know, brown rice, you know, I mean, conventional wisdom would say that brown rice is definitely be- is better than white rice because, um, because the shell hasn't been removed from the rice. And, right. um, but if, but if you actually compare brown and white rice from a nutritional standpoint, they're not that much different. I think brown rice has a little bit more fiber, but it's not a whole. It's, it's we're talking like usually one gram per serving or something like that. So yeah. it's not a it's not a huge difference. So I think in terms of rice, you know whether you do brown or white is probably not as big of a deal. Mm-hmm. Um, you also have to consider it in the context of an overall meal. Yes, um, and an overall diet, right? I mean, unless like yeah, what are, are you eating? Uh, you know, two pounds of rice a day. Well, then. Yeah, then then we, they, it probably is relevant, but then there's a bigger problem here. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. It's like, you know, again, you know, let's, let's talk again, again about like blood glucose control, things like that. Well, there's a lot of things that affect, you know, how fast glucose enters your bloodstream from whatever meal you eat. And if you're eating a mixed meal with protein and vegetables and everything like that, like the type of rice you're eating probably really isn't going to make any difference right. um, because you've – You've got some other things, you know, you've got the vegetables you're eating, so you're providing fiber from the vegetables, things like that. You've got your protein intake. All those things are going to um, also impact. So so it's like you said, if I'm just eating pure rice all the time, then yeah, whole, whole brown rice is probably going to be better than white. But if I'm eating mixed meals, do I need to be eating brown rice versus white rice? It's probably not going to matter. Yeah, so, go, go, with, go with whichever one you like the most. Yeah. And that comes down to adherence, you know. I mean, you have to think about the adherence factor um, with any type of dietary strategy. I mean, again, it's why I typically favor flexible dieting because the best diet is the one you can stick to, right? Yeah, whether it's low carb, paleo, I don't care what it is. Adherence is by far is the biggest predictor of fat loss success by by far. I mean, I mean by far. And so it's what you can stick to, you know. You know, you look at these randomized controlled trials comparing low carb to high carb and stuff like that. And a lot of studies sometimes may show small differences Mm -hmm. in the average weight loss and stuff. And then you get, you know, people in the low carb camp, you know, they'll point to this one study and they'll say, oh, look at that. See, low carb is the best or whatever. And it's, and you know, and it's something like a two pound difference over a year. I mean, it's some ridiculously small number. And in, in a lot of cases, protein isn't controlled for in those. So like the protein, oh, yeah, exactly. you know, the protein intake is different and you can't, you're not comparing apples to apples here. You can't, yeah. you know, you're comparing a high protein, low carb to a low protein, high carb. That, that's not, that's useless. Yeah, that's, that's exactly, that's what happens when people switch to low carb is usually their protein intake automatically goes up. And, yeah. and in fact, there's research showing that most of the satiety benefit from low carb dieting actually comes from the high protein part yeah. and not the low carb part. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I've, I've written about that extensively and, you know, I, and also there, I think it, it's kind of ironic that a low carb diet has become popular in the fitness you know, space in particular, because there's no question that a high carb diet is better for gaining muscle and strength. I don't know how there, there's, there's plenty of evidence for that both published and then just anecdotally. Yeah. Like, 
go go follow a strength training program for a year on a low or try try out you know six months on a low carb diet and then start eating you know carbs and see how you feel and see how your training goes yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. you don't even need to any scientific research you can just go do it yeah yeah unless you're training like all super low volume you know where yeah, you're not really tapping true. into your glycogen stores um, but if you're training with any decent amount of volume, yeah, it's you're not going to be able to do it on a low carb diet for an extended period of time. Yeah. Um, so on the grains, what do you like? Um, other, you know, so we have oatmeal. Obviously, is a is a good choice. Um, oh yeah, oatmeal's great. Yeah, yeah I like oatmeal uh, a lot. Um, you know, quinoa. Uh, are there any other kind of grains that you like to eat that are again stuff that you're generally going to be you know you're going to be preparing yourself. In terms of breads and stuff, do you say, you know, it doesn't really matter, pick whichever one you like? Yeah, usually with breads, I just look at the fiber content again. Okay. Um, usually, I uh, I mean, most of the time it's going to be some type of whole wheat bread, but I mean, a lot of times, you know, when I get bread, you know, I'll either just go to Costco and get the, the Kirkland multigrain bread or whatever, which has something like five grams per slice. Mm. You know, my wife likes to get uh, these sandwich thins. Um, these oral wheat sandwich thins, but they have a pretty decent amount of fiber per slice as well. I, I, I can't remember exactly, but, but again, usually that's the one thing I'm looking at. And every time I pick out some bread from the thing, the first thing I'm looking at is the fiber content. Yeah, it makes you know? sense. And so. you know, I think it's also worth adding, um, that it also coming back to what you said in the beginning of the, of the interview with, with gluten intolerance. And that's obviously a whole nother discussion. That's a whole thing right now. And yeah, you know, from, from the, I was doing some reading on it even recently that it looks like there, it is, it is a thing. It's just not as prevalent as, you know, many people would have us believe. I mean, you yeah. have, you have celiac, of course, but then you also can have people that they just don't do well with gluten. And I get asked about this a lot and I, I'm sure people listening are kind of wondering, even in, even, you know, in the context of grains, how do you know? And what I've told people, and I'd be curious as to your take on it is, okay, so if you're eating, if you go eat a bowl of pasta, and it hurt, and, and you don't feel good, and you know you're stun, you, have, you get a stomach ache, or you're getting gassy or bloated, and you find that you know that tends to happen when you eat uh, certain types of grains or or, or gluten containing foods, then just don't eat them. Yeah, and kind of across the board, like if there's any food that you're eating, like you know some people I've come across people that have a food map sensitivity, they didn't know it, and it was confusing yeah. to them, and you know they would find out like oh when they eat when they eat beans they don't feel good, like they they get bloated, their stomach is just off. Yeah, and so so that's like a, an easy way to know if you do well with wheat, then do you eat it and you feel totally fine? You probably do well with wheat. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. I, I don't know of any other way beyond getting scientifically tested somehow um you know yeah you just go by how you feel yeah if certain again there's no there's no rule that you have to eat grains or that you have to eat you know this type of food or you have to eat that type of food you know again if most of your foods are coming from whole foods then you know it doesn't it doesn't really matter but at the same time you don't need to avoid grains either you yes. know it's like if if you feel yeah if you feel crappy eating grains then or certain types of grains, then don't eat them. I mean, you don't, you know, there's no requirement, you know, you're not going to miss out on some magical health benefit or something like that if you don't eat certain grains. So, but at the same time, don't be you know, afraid of not, they're not also going to harm you. There's not some evil component in these grains that, that, you know, if you aren't sensitive in some way, there's not some component in there that's going to somehow cause you long-term health problems or, you know, was it Perlmutter? He made some quote, just ridiculous quote one time. It was some something like that grains were, were like this generation's tobacco. It was just like, yeah. I was yeah, like, yeah, are you yeah. kidding me? It was just some <laughs> stupid comment. Yeah. So, yeah, um, that, that's, it's not, that's it's not this generation's tobacco. It was just ridiculous. That just, that makes for a good headline. Yeah. Um, all right. So now let me pose this to you. So this is also something that, you know, I, I, people people ask me about. So you you have... Um, you're talking about misinterpreting research uh, or misrepresenting it or just taking stuff out of context or whatever. And yeah. um, so something that, you know, anti-grain people have, have come to me with is the idea that um, basically the science 
is stunted in this area and that because of the amount of money and, and the, the, essentially the, the, the politics of, of science, which, I mean, that's, again, that's a, that's a different discussion. I think that there are legitimate points to be made, not necessarily with grains, but just in general, of, yeah. you know, the, the, the game of, of getting published and what it really takes and so forth. Um, but I know that there definitely are people out there that, that are, have at least heard that, like, well, the reason why somebody like you would say this is not because you're in the pocket of big grain or whatever but it's just that big grain has a stranglehold on the science and has manipulated things and you know i hear this from people that think dairy is also the gonna kill you and you know and, and i'll and i'll and i'll and i'll uh, sometimes send over research on things like this and then they'll be like oh well you know they just they'll try to say it's invalid research um and especially if the funding came from Anything having to do with like sugar, I, I run across this all the time as well. People think yeah. that that sugar is just, you know, it's it's a straight toxin and you should never have any. And uh, in, and there's good research out there that there was one study. I think it was a UK Bureau of Sugar. It was um, uh, it was a it was a review on on the whole subject, and it's a good read. Like if you actually read it, it's good research. That's I mean, it's a good paper. But some people will reject that stuff out of hand because of where the funding comes from, or just out of like almost like it's a conspiracy theory of some kind. Yeah. You know what I mean? So. When it comes to funding, so I mean, the people that say this do not understand research and they don't understand how it works. They, they, they just totally clueless. And, um, and I say that because number one, there are literally thousands of scientists across the world studying grains. Mm. Now there's no way that all of those scientists are somehow in the pocket of big grain. No way. There's thousands of them, different countries, different, you know, universities. different universities. And, and so this idea of some massive conspiracy is ridiculous, um, just, you know, because here's the deal, just the math of people need to think about the math of conspiracies, right? So and I've talked about this before, the math of conspiracies, if you want to pull off a successful conspiracy, you cannot have a lot of people involved. Because the more people that are involved, the less likely your conspiracy is going to be successful, because at some point, someone is going to blow the whistle or totally screw everything up. You can't, you know, that's why I laugh at people who think that JFK was assassinated by some massive government conspiracy. It's like, there's no way it, it's impossible. You know, anyone who actually knows the history of Lee Harvey Oswald and how he got the job at the book depository and all that stuff, there would have literally had to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people involved in somehow setting this thing up. And then they would have had to stay quiet for decades after that i'm sorry it doesn't that's not how conspiracies work okay yeah i'm pretty you know, sure actually that is going to there's the the, the, doc, the government documents that are going to be declassified in our lifetime i think it's 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 soon it's sooner rather than later i, yeah, don't, I honestly don't know enough about it. i haven't read enough about it i mean i'm 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 a skeptical person and a cynical person so i look yeah. in, i mean, if we're talking government i look in the history of government and one for one, the worst people inevitably rise to the top and fuck everything up and break it for everybody, basically. So, yeah. I, you know, I, I would say I, I don't know anything about that. But if they, if if people in government could somehow, for their own selfish reasons, their own self gain, do something like that, I would not put it beyond humans to want to do that. But, yeah, I totally understand what you're saying. I mean, if you're talking about how you're going to get hundreds of people to all stay silent and all do what they need to do and, you know. Yeah, that's and that's the thing. It's just like so. So in the realm of science, which is even would even be worse because again, you've got people, multiple people in thousands of people, thousands of scientists across different countries, all studying the same thing, coming to similar conclusions, and not all of this research is funded by big grain. Yeah. So, so you can't sit there and say, well, you know, some, you know, it's big. They're in the pockets of big grain because a lot of them are not. The second thing I want to say to that is. Even if a big grain company funds a study, what people need to understand is that that does not mean that they were actually involved in the data collection, in whether or not the results were published, things like that. And the reason I say that is I'm going to use myself as an example. My first study that I ever published was a study on glutamine supplementation. EAS, the supplement company, funded my study. Okay. But that was the only involvement they had. We wrote a grant. We submitted it to them. 
They agreed to fund the study. They gave us some money, and that's all. That, that's all they did. There was no pressure from that. They none of their people were involved in the study. Mm-hmm. There was no pressure from them to try to somehow produce positive results. Mm-hmm. You know, they agreed that if we had positive or negative results, that we would still publish. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, these people who, who and we published our results and our, our results were actually kind of mixed. You know, mm-hmm. we saw some positive results and we saw some some negative results mm-hmm. and we published both. Now, someone who reads my study, if they just looked at the funding source, they're like, oh, no, we, we can't listen to this study. EAS funded it. Yep. <laughs> but it, without just actually the, analyzing the research and. Yeah, they weren't actually doing all the work. They, they, they were not involved in any step, you know. The only thing they gave us was the money to allow us to do the work. Yeah. And that was it. Now, I would so say. People need to understand that. Yeah. And I'd say because, I mean, you have integrity, obviously, <laughs> that you, you did it the way that you did it. I would say, though, that theoretically, you probably had a financial incentive to, uh, like, if you would have published results that made them very happy, then there's maybe a, it would be more likely that they would come back to you, you know, for more work. Um, you know, and, and I, I think it should be said not- because I'm going to say that there are like there's an HMB study in particular that's a fucking joke that has been used to sell HMB as if it's better than steroids. Where essentially, oh, I, yeah, I know about that. So, so that kind of that kind of stuff is out there, and it gets. Oh, I know, and that stuff does exist. I, I'm not saying that that you should not pay any attention to funding source. So, so, but what I what I am saying is that you can't use funding source as an automatic reason to write off a study. Right. You know. You have to look at the overall body of work that's out there. You know, you got, you got to look at the methodology, things like that. Like the HMB study that you talked about, the thing is, is even not ignoring any funding source, if you look at the study, the results are so like I mean, that's ridiculous. All you, absolutely. That's where it, it already starts right there. In 10 weeks, they gained how much muscle and lost how yeah, much Yeah, it was just ridiculous. The, the results are already just so unbelievably ridiculous. That, that right there, I don't even need to know who funded the study. That doesn't matter. Just yeah. looking at the study itself, that's all I need to know. Yeah. That, that, hey. And so. Well, a lot of people don't know that, though, especially people that are. And, know. And, that, you know, and, I, and I, do, you know, I do understand that. But again, if, if we have especially a large body of evidence like we do with grains, mm-hmm. you know, not all of it is funded by industry. You know, a lot of it, there's a lot of studies out there that are not funded by industry that have similar findings. So, so when you look at the weight of the evidence, and if I've got. Yeah, some some studies funded by industry showing one way, but then the non-funded in non-industry funded studies are showing the same thing. Then you know what? Then it's not the industry. You know, it's not industry influencing the results. It's just the truth. You know, totally. so um, so you got to look at the body of evidence, and yeah, I'm not sure what else to say on that. Yeah, um, sure. No, it's just that was, I thought that was a, a point worth bringing up because it's something yeah. I do come across that people. Uh, and it's also then you have the the some of the anti-grain people will say things like that um, to further bolster their position and, and, you know, uh, further legitimize their, their argument basically. Yeah. So hold on. I got to go check the mail. I I got to, I got to check. I got to go get my check from big rain right now. Now (laughs) (laughs) for giving that plug I just gave. (laughs) That's what it is. I was the wire. The wire just hit your account. Yeah, I know. I wish. uh, I actually kind of laugh at some people like uh, there was there's one guy just recently I got an email from some guy it was it was about a, a presentation I gave on sugar and he like accused me of working for Monsanto and everything like that and I'm just like I'm like I'm like what do these people think that we're just getting these massive checks from these companies like I just like <laughs> If, I don't know. I if, just thought it was only. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I like. I wish it was true, man. <laughs> I must be missing out. I must be doing something wrong because I'm not getting anything. <laughs> you're you're not a part of the Illuminati, man. I mean, just get no. <laughs> um, Okay, great. So yeah, I think that is a good kind of just overview of the entire subject. I think we've kind of touched on all the major things. Is there anything else that you come across or that you think should be uh, mentioned on it before? wrapping up i can't really think of anything else i think we kind of touched on all the major stuff yeah so oh one thing actually that is i think uh, another thing that you know get that gets brought up is um this idea of genetically modified grains and that that because that also gets targeted as like okay if you have the special ancient egyptian einkorn whatever you know grain then you're fine but if you're having the genetically modified grain you know that's bad 
Yeah, so that gives that's really almost a whole discussion on GMOs in general. Sure, we don't have to go down that whole you know road but for this discussion. But again, what people need to realize is is everything we eat is a genetically modified or organism, or, or you know everything is genetically modified. We ourselves are genetically modified organisms. Just through, the process of evolution is a process of genetic modification. Right. It's just how it's done. And there, are mental, there are a lot of ways that, that we can genetically modify things, whether it's through crossbreeding, you know, which some people would say be the natural way, um, or through inserting genes directly you know, into things. It's all genetic modification. And so this idea that somehow a genetically modified thing is somehow worse than, than something that, that, you know, that is quote-unquote natural – I mean, it kind of goes into the whole artificial versus natural fallacy, which in and of itself is a whole argument. So, right, um, right. Um, and I mean, as far as I know on this point with wheat in particular, really what we're looking at, we're looking at, you know, the uh, wheat that has been naturally crossbred and selectively bred and changed. So, I mean, I, I don't uh, – the majority of the wheat from – again, from, from what I've read is it's not even like it's coming out of a lab. These are – yeah. this is like yeah. it's generations of wheat farmers that have – uh, continue to you know uh, genetically modify their wheat but done yeah. through done done actually in a natural fashion yeah and it, my, my i guess my stance you know anyone who's going to tell me that the gmo that anything that's gmo is somehow unsafe i'm i'm gonna i would say the burden of the proof on, on is on them mm -hmm. okay you prove to me that's unsafe show me the evidence that it somehow causes some type of harm because you know, the evidence on, on the safety of GMOs is just continues to grow day by day. You know, I would say the burden of proof is on anyone who's going to tell me that it's unsafe in some way, you know, because really it's just more, I would say it's just more emotional fear mongering more than anything else. It's not, you know, it's not based on any solid data or, or evidence. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a, some, that's an area that I've done a bit of reading on and a bit of research on, and I've kind of tried to look at both sides of the argument and, you know, I don't know, it's, it's tough to, because you have people that you have are, are very pedigreed on both sides of it, actually. And I see the, I guess some of the, some of the more sober, I wouldn't say they're anti GMO arguments I've seen have been more along the lines of in specific, certain types of modifications and, and certain types of crossbreeding of different species of animals, like these super Franken salmon and stuff, not that or salmon, but it's not that it's necessarily going to, it's bad for us, but, and again, this is not an area I would consider myself an expert on at all, yeah. uh, but that basically some of the smarter arguments I, and that have made sense to me is that we may 30 years from now, look back on some of this stuff that we were doing and and say that was probably not a good idea we should have gone about that differently not that there shouldn't be any sort of you know genetic modification at all but again that's a that's something that i just personally don't know enough about to have a strong position on yeah it's you could hold do a, you could do a whole podcast on GMOs, i know i would actually you know, be interested to do it it's something i've intentionally avoided personally because i don't want to yeah. represent myself as you know understanding more about something than i really do and you know yeah. i've kind of like been in the middle on that one where it's like i, I mean I, I can see both sides it's hard for me i feel like i don't have enough a deep enough understanding to con conclusively say this is where i stand on it you know yeah a, a good guy to um who's really knowledgeable about gmos is i don't know if you've ever heard of kevin fulta Mm -mm. Um, I'll check. I'm going to make a note. Yeah. So he's, um, he's, he's a very knowledgeable, um, individual on GMOs and the science of it and things like that. Cool. So maybe you could introduce me actually, if you wouldn't mind. I, I don't know him personally. I just know I follow him on Facebook and things and, uh, he's unfortunate. You know, I kind of feel bad for the guy cause, cause he's been, he's been the target of some anti GMO organizations, mm -hmm. you know, and he's just doing his work. He's just doing his work, his science and stuff. It, it's, um, but uh, yeah, Kevin M. Folta, I think is. I, I, I know his name is Kevin Folta, but okay, yeah. I'll check if you out. just did a search for Kevin Folta GMOs or whatever, you'd uh, you, you'll you'll come you'll find him. So he he was at the he was at the University of Florida, I think, but I don't know if he's still there. I'm not sure if he's still there or not. So okay, great, thanks. I'll I'll reach out to him. That'd be an interesting discussion. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, um, I think that 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 is uh, kind of wraps up the whole grains discussion. So let, let everybody know where can they find you. Um, you know, if, if you have any uh, specific projects that you're working on that you want to let everybody know about. 
Yeah, so um, you can find my website at weightology.net, um, and there I have a um, I have a lot of free articles on a lot of different topics, body composition testing, insulin. I have a very popular series on insulin mm -hmm. that right. I've written in the past. And then I also have a members-only um, area where people pay a really cheap monthly fee of like 11 or 12 bucks per month. Um, and I basically do research reviews um, on all kinds of topics related to mu building muscle or losing fat. Um, and then I also do like video presentations and, and a lot of other, uh, I have an ask James section where people can ask me questions. So that's another you know thing people might want to check out. Uh, and then I have, you know, all the different podcasts I've been on, you know, including this one, I'll post it up there, you know, once this one's ready. Cool. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so people can find out more about me there. I've also got a list of all my scientific publications on there. More projects on the way. I'm collaborating with Brad Schoenfeld on more stuff. We got more stuff, you know. Um, I was actually running some stats last night on a research study for him. Um, and I've got two more, two more things in the works that uh, working with him. Um, and I'm also going to be setting up a coaching business on my website too, um, here probably in the next two, two to three weeks, hopefully it'll be up and running. So, Great. um, so yeah, so got a lot of, a lot of stuff going on and I'm giving some talks this year. I'm giving a talk in, uh, Spokane inland empire, uh, fitness conference in Spokane, Washington. Um, and then later in the year, uh, I'll be talking at the AFPT conference in Norway. Um, and then other guys will be there. Alan Aragon will be there. Brett Contreras will be there. A lot of other notable figures in the industry will be there as well. So, Awesome. That's great. Okay, cool. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I recommend everybody go and check out James's work. I've been reading your stuff. I, I was reading your stuff before you had it paid when it was all oh. this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've yeah. been following your stuff for a while. That's all, um, I, I'm fine. glad to get you on the podcast and be able to talk. Oh, yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, all right. Well, thanks again for taking the time. It was a great discussion. I think people, it's going to answer a lot of people's questions about grain. So it's going to be, it's going to be something nice that I can shuttle people over to now and say, whenever they ask about grains here, come check this out. I yeah, think yeah. I think I think this will take care of you. Yeah. Thanks. Yep.